This is the introductory lecture for our next topic, which is love. So I say it's love. Really, the main topic we're going to be investigating in this section is uh, how love is related to reason or rationality. So uh, do we love for reasons? And if so, why? Or what are those reasons? And if not, uh, why not? And so our first topic uh, on, on, in the outline of the lecture is why care about whether we love for reasons or something like that? Why is this an interesting topic? So I think broadly there are two sorts of reasons. So the first sort of reason is that, as you will see very quickly when you start reading the articles, although the main topic is whether love is rational or not, whether we love for reasons or not, in order to answer this question, all of the authors almost immediately have to start talking about what is love. So even though we limit ourselves to a small question, is love rational, it actually it blows up into a large question, what is love? And why might we be interested in that question, that larger question, what is love? Well, there's lots of reasons you might be interested in what love is, but just for three, three of the big ones, maybe, so first, uh, just you know, love plays a very large role in many people's lives, maybe in everybody's lives. Uh, it seems sort of one of the things that is central to the human condition in a lot of ways. And so it just seems like it's a very important feature of existence. And so uh, why would you care what is love? Well, because it's a very salient feature of your life. Uh, and you might be just curious about very important things in your life and want to know more about those. So we might be interested in what is love just because it's so big and important and omnipresent and people uh, give up lots of things for it or expend a lot of effort trying to get it and place a lot of value on it. And so maybe we should be interested in what is this thing. Another reason to be interested in love is that love is, at least in part perhaps, an emotion. And philosophy and intellectual inquiry more broadly uh, are interested in what are emotions, why do we have them, what does it mean that we have them, what are, is the nature of emotions. If you start to think about it for a while, it's uh, really interesting to try to figure out all the various things that go into emotions, what their properties are, what sets the different emotions apart from each other. One big question is whether we can judge emotions in terms of appropriateness. So uh, fear is the example we often use for this. So if you're afraid of a tiger because it's trying to eat you, that maybe seems like appropriate fear. If you're afraid of a spider just because it looks scary to you, is that an appropriate fear? Or maybe it's kind of inappropriate. If it's a deadly spider, it would be appropriate. But if it's just a harmless spider, should you be afraid of it? Do you even have control over whether you're afraid of it? If you don't have control, does that change things? Why might you be afraid of something if it's not fearful? So that's a question about whether fear is fitting, but we can ask this sort of thing for all sorts of emotions, whether these are fitting or not. We can ask it about love, or maybe we can't ask it about love. That's gonna be a question that'll come up in the reading. But uh, so whether an emotion is sort of appropriate or fitting is an interesting question. How do emotions fit in with sort of everything else going on in our lives? So how do emotions match up with rationality, another big feature of human existence? That's a good question. And so just exploring the nature of emotions is something you might be interested in. And love seems to be an important or very salient emotion. And then finally, the third reason, <laughs> look, Philosophy is interested in almost everything. So for almost any topic you can come up with, there are philosophers sort of interested in figuring out what is it, what are its properties, what can we say about it, does it exist, if it exists, why does it exist, in what way does it exist. And so whether or not that interests you, it doesn't matter, but <laughs> that's just to point out like why might somebody, why are these philosophers interested in figuring out what love is? One reason might just be because it's there, because it exists and they're curious. They just have 
intellectual curiosity about some feature of the world. And so one of the interesting things about philosophy is that really just for anything, you can turn philosophy's gaze on that thing and come up with stuff to say. So that's not an exhaustive reason, or not an exhaustive list of reasons you might be interested in figuring out what love is, but those are three to maybe think about. Um, maybe you have other reasons for being interested in love, and great, we'll see how these articles match up with that. But hopefully, whatever reasons you have for being interested in love, because these articles substantially talk about what is love, uh, hopefully they'll have some link to what you're interested in. So that's the first reason you might care about this debate about reasons for love, which is the love stuff. The second reason up in the outline uh, says uh, reason, and in fact it could also say rationality. So it's not just love that's important and plays a big role in our lives. We also, uh, reason plays a large role in our lives. Humans are sort of rational creatures. Uh, we have the ability to think about things and reflect on things. And one thing that philosophy is very interested in is sort of what exactly is the role of reason in our lives? So what does it mean to say that we are rational creatures? And we can divide this into two kinds of topics, uh, descriptive and normative. So the descriptive question is sort of, are we rational creatures? Like I just said we are, but am I, am I correct? Uh, are we rational? If we are rational, to what degree? Are we perfectly rational? I mean, probably not. If we're not perfectly rational, what kind of rational are we? When are we rational? When are we irrational? What does it even mean to be rational? Like, I don't know, if, you, if I tell you somebody is a rational person or is behaving rationally or irrationally, or if somebody is behaving according to reasons or unreasonably, what do I even mean? Like, what does this mean? So that's the sort of descriptive project, which is to explain what is it to be rational? What is it to have reasons for things? What is it to be a creature that operates according to reasons to some degree or another? And so lots of philosophy is really interested in this. So what role does reason play in human lives? What does it even mean to say reason plays a role in human lives? Rationality plays a role? So what is that? And to figure out those questions, we want to look at all the various forms of reason, all the various places reason shows up, which means, among many other things, figuring out where does reason fit into love? Because humans certainly love each other quite a bit. And so the question is, do they love for reasons? If they do, what kind of reasons do they love for? And so part of this project investigating reasons for love is figuring out sort of descriptively, just describing how humans work, what's going on with rationality and love. And then this concern over reasons and rationality also has a normative component, by which I mean many philosophers are interested not just in describing what is reason or are humans rational, but also in figuring out is there anything sort of good about reason? Should humans be rational? Is it better to be rational than irrational? So if uh, you find out that something you want to do is an irrational thing to do, does that tell you not to do it? Should you do it? Like, it, do, should this impact your life at all? Uh, does it matter if love is irrational? Does that make it worse? Does that make it better? Could it be better to act unreasonably? Could it be better to ignore reason and all of these things? So normativity is a big part of trying to think about and understand reasons and rationality in philosophy. And you might think that comes up, especially in love. We think love is very important. If love is irrational, maybe that means rationality is not very important. Or maybe because love is so important, but rationality is so important, we have to find some way of making love a rational thing. Otherwise, much of our lives would be devoted to irrational things and we would all be making huge mistakes. So those are some reasons to care about reasons and rationality, both broadly and how they connect to love. And so hopefully some reasons for caring about uh, the topic that we're doing in this section, which is investigating reasons to love. Next topic, analytic philosophy of love. So when you read these <laughs> four articles, 
uh, like everything else we've been reading, uh, they're complicated and they're detailed and uh, they draw lots of distinctions and they're talking about lots of different theories. And uh, you may or may not already have gotten frustrated with this. Maybe you will become frustrated at some point. Uh, in the love section, you might start to say, what, what is all this? Like, why? Th th uh, this is not the way to think about love. This is not the way to approach love. Surely the right way to approach love is not like coming up with all these different theories and distinctions and all these examples and back and forth and blah, like this. This can't be what analysis of love is. And so this is just to point out what we're doing here is sort of, it's called analytic philosophy, or I mean, it it's kind of like, it, sorry, so uh, just the, sh the short version. What we're doing is called analytic philosophy, and one of the things that characterizes what we're doing is that it takes the form of what you're reading in these articles. So uh, you will see what these articles look like, but broadly they look like what we've read already. And of course that's not the only way to investigate love. Of course that's not the only sort of approach to take uh, to love. You know, there are lots of ways of investigating uh, love. You can write poems or you can sort of experience it yourself and just like feel it as opposed to writing and reading about it in this complicated way. You can, uh, you know, make other art about it and so on and so forth. So the, I encourage you not to sort of get fed up about this approach in terms of thinking this is like failing to capture what's important about love or it's not doing justice to love or something. Uh, just see it as a different way of approaching the topic. Now, you might decide this way sucks. <laughs> like it's a, You don't get anything out of this way of approaching the topic uh, compared to what you'd get like reading poems about love or novels about love or watching plays about love or something. So that's fine. Like this, this is just one way of investigating the world. There are, I mean, here's another way of investigating love. You take somebody in love and you stick them in an MRI or something. That's a way of learning about love. Is that valuable or not? Look, I don't, you know, different people find different approaches valuable. So, um, I like, I'm not trying to like head off criticism or something. I'm just trying to sort of help you see the value of what we're going to be doing in this section. Uh, why, like, you take a big topic like love and you might think, how are we going to look at it? And it turns out, oh, we end up looking at it the same way we've looked at everything in this class, which is uh, very precise and complicated articles on the topic with arguments back and forth. And what's the value of this? Well, I, I think the proof is sort of, the proof of value is in what you get from it. And if you don't get anything from it, that's quite all right. Like not everything is going to work for everybody. So um, I encourage you to try to get something from it, but I don't feel like bad or wrong if this seems like a misguided approach to you. Um, you know, MRIs seem like a misguided approach to me. That's why I'm a philosopher rather than a scientist. But uh, there's just different ways of approaching things. And finally, this leads us to the last topic, which is there is like more philosophy, more styles of philosophy than what we're reading for this love section. And specifically, we're going to see Plato's Symposium is going to give us kind of lots of other approaches to love. And so uh, our next topic is Plato, but Plato's first dialogue that we're reading is the symposium. The symposium is about love, and the symposium has some of this stuff, but it also has other approaches to the topic. It has people telling stories and myths and things like this. And so uh, we're going to get a much broader conception of philosophy when it comes to Plato because as you'll see in the symposium and as you see in this little picture right here it's like it's a bunch of different people giving speeches and they all have their different approaches to philosophy so um if you get to the end of these four articles and you say this is not how i want to think about love uh there you know there's more to philosophy of love than just this and it's coming up next so be ready <laughs>